Warning, the video you are about to watch may contain language and scenarios of a highly adult nature and is therefore not intended for children under the age of 18. Viewer discretion is advised. Hey, what is up guys? This is Couch Potato Mike, back in the book club, and for the first time ever, not for anything written by E.L. James. No, we are starting a new literary adventure today with Gabriel's Inferno by Sylvan Reynard. Author of Gabriel's Rapture, which is one of the sequels. I don't know why that's on the first book. I don't know. Anyway, uh, no, we're starting a Gabriel's Inferno today. You guys voted, and this is where most of the votes went. So we're going to be going along. Uh, so far, this is a four-book series. We're only reading one of these today. Not the whole book, mind you. And you'll notice that, you notice that, these, uh, that this video was titled Part 1, not Chapter 1. Um, some of these chapters are really, really short. So you're going to get a few of them right off the bat here. So... Uh, before we get into that, I want to remind you guys, if you haven't subscribed, if you're not subscribed, please go ahead and subscribe. What's it going to hurt? Uh, I'm trying to, still trying to get to a thousand subscribers like I have been for, sad to say, years now. Help me out here. If you're not subscribed, go ahead and subscribe. And go ahead and uh, hit the thumbs up. That like button helps out with that YouTube algorithm. It helps to spread the word of my majesty far and wide come on you want everybody to hear my majesty you know you do so do that and share and like and comment down below let me uh, know uh, your thoughts on the book <coughs> as it goes and any other thoughts you might have so without further ado let's go ahead and get into Gabriel's Inferno by Sylvan Reynard In memoriam me resurgem. I don't know, that might be Italian. Oh, pictures, look. Right there. This is Dante and Virgil crossing the river Styx, engraving from 1870 by Gustav Doré. Can look at that? Yeah. Pictures and everything. I didn't know this was going to be a picture book. <clears throat> Prologue, Florence, 1283. The poet stood next to the bridge and watched as the young woman approached. The world ground to a near standstill as he remarked her wide, dark eyes and elegantly curled brown hair. At first he didn't recognize her. She was breathtakingly beautiful, her movements sure and graceful. Yet there was something about her face and figure that reminded him of the girl he'd fallen in love with long ago. They had gone their separate ways, and he had always mourned her, his angel, his muse, his beloved Beatrice. Without her, his life had been lonely and small. Now his blessedness appeared. As she approached him with her companions, he bowed his head and body in a chivalrous salute. He had no expectation that his presence would be acknowledged. She was both perfect and untouchable a brown-eyed angel dressed in resplendent white, while he was older, world-weary, and wanting. She had almost passed him when his downcast eyes caught sight of one of her slippers, a slipper that hesitated just in front of him. His heart beat a furious tattoo as he waited, breathless. A soft and gentle voice broke into his remembrances as she spoke to him kindly. His startled eyes flew to hers. For years and years he'd longed for this moment, dreamed of it even, but never had he imagined encountering her in such a serendipitous fashion, and never had he dared hope he would be greeted so sweetly. <clears throat> Caught off balance, he mumbled his pleasantries and allowed himself the indulgence of a smile, a smile that was returned to him tenfold by the muse. His heart swelled within him as the love he had held for her multiplied and burned like an inferno in his chest. 
Alas, their conversation was all too brief before she declared that she must depart. He bowed before her as she swept by, and then straightened to stare at her retreating form. His joy at their reunion was tempered by an emergent sadness, as he wondered if he would ever see her again. <clears throat> Chapter 1 Miss Mitchell? Professor Gabriel Emerson's voice carried across the seminar room to the attractive brown-eyed young woman who was seated at the back. Lost in thought, or lost in translation, her head was down as she scribbled furiously in her notebook. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. Ten pairs of eyes swung to her, to her pale face and long lashes, her thin white fingers clutching a pen. Then ten pairs of eyes swung back to the professor, who stood perfectly still and began to scowl. His scathing demeanor contrasted sharply with the overall symmetry of his features, his large, expressive eyes and full mouth. He was ruggedly handsome, but in that moment bitterly severe, which rather ruined the overall pleasing effect of his appearance. Ahem! <coughs> A modest cough to her right caught the woman's attention. She glanced in surprise at the broad-shouldered man sitting next to her. He smiled and flicked his eyes to the front of the room, back to the professor. She followed his gaze slowly, looking up into a pair of angry, peering blue eyes. She swallowed noisily. I expect an answer to my question, Miss Mitchell, if you'd care to join us. His voice was glacial, like his eyes. The other graduate students shifted in their seats and stole furtive glances at one another. Their expressions said what crawled up his ass, but they said nothing, for it is commonly known that the graduate students are loath to confront their professors with respect to anything, let alone rude behavior. The young woman opened her mouth minutely and closed it, staring into those unblinking blue eyes, her own eyes wide like, frightened, like a frightened rabbit. Is English your first language? He mocked her. <clears throat> a raven-haired woman seated at his right hand tried to stifle a laugh, smothering it in an unconvincing cough. All eyes shifted back to the frightened rabbit, whose skin exploded into crimson as she ducked her head, finally escaping the professor's gaze. <clears throat> Since Miss Mitchell seems to be carrying on a parallel seminar in a different language, perhaps someone else would be kind enough to answer my question. The beauty to his right was only too eager. She turned to face him and beamed as she answered his question in great detail, making a show of herself by gesturing with her hands as she quoted Dante in his original Italian. <clears throat> when she had finished, she smiled acidly at the back of the room, then proceeded to gaze up at the professor and sigh. All that was lacking from her display was a quick leap to the floor and a rubbing of her back on his leg to show that she would be his pet forever. Not that he would have appreciated the gesture. The professor frowned almost imperceptibly <clears throat> at no one in particular and turned his back to write on the board. The frightened rabbit blinked back tears as she continued scribbling, but mercifully she did not cry. A few minutes later, as the professor droned on and on about the conflict between the Guelphs and the Gebelli, maybe I should have listened to this first, between the Guelphs and the Gebellinis, a small square of folded paper appeared on top of the Frightened Rabbit's Italian Dictionary. At first she didn't notice it, but once again a soft ahem drew her attention to the good-looking man beside her. He smiled more widely this time, almost eagerly, and glanced down at the paper. She saw it and blinked, carefully watching the back of the professor as he drew endless circles around endless Italian words. She brought the paper to her lap, where she quietly unfolded it. Emerson is an ass. No one would have noticed because no one was looking at her, except for the man at her side. As soon as she read these words, a different kind of flush appeared on her face. Two pink clouds on the curves of her cheeks, and she smiled. Not enough to show teeth, or what could be dimples or a laugh line or two, but a smile nonetheless. She raised her large eyes to the man next to her and looked at him shyly. 
A wide, friendly grin spread across his face. Something funny, Miss Mitchell. Her brown eyes dilated in terror. Her new friend's smile quickly disappeared as he turned to look at the professor. She knew better now than to look up at the professor's cold blue eyes. Instead, she put her head down and worried her plump lower lip between her teeth. Back and forth and back and forth. It was my fault, Professor. I was just asking what page we were on, the friendly man interceded on her behalf. Hardly an appropriate question for a doctoral student, Paul. But since you asked, we began with the first canto. I trust you could find it without Miss Mitchell's help. Oh, and Miss Mitchell? The frightened rabbit's ponytail trembled ever so slightly as she lifted her gaze. See me in my office after class. Chapter 2 At the end of the seminar, Julia... This is getting on my nerves. At the end of the seminar, Julia Mitchell hastily tucked the folded piece of paper she'd been cradling in her lap into her Italian dictionary under the entry, Asino. Sorry about all that. I'm Paul Norris, the friendly man extended his large paw over the table. She shook it gently, and he marveled at how small her hand was in comparison to his. He could have bruised it just by flexing his palm. Hello, Paul. I'm Julia. Julia Mitchell. Good to meet you, Julia. I'm sorry the professor was such a prick. I don't know what's eating him. Paul gave Emerson his preferred title with no little sarcasm. She reddened slightly and turned back to her books. You're new? He persisted, tilting his head a little as if he were trying to catch her eye. Just arrived from St. Joseph's University. He nodded as if he meant something. And you're here for a master's? Yes, she gestured to the front of the now empty seminar room. It probably doesn't seem like it, but I'm supposed to be studying to be a Dante specialist. Paul whistled through his teeth. So you're here for Emerson? She nodded, and she noticed that the veins in her neck began to pulse slightly as her heart rate quickened. Since she couldn't find an explanation for her reaction, he dismissed it. Since he couldn't find an explanation for her reaction, he dismissed it. But he would be reminded of it later. He's difficult to work with, so he doesn't have a lot of students. I'm writing my dissertation with him. And there's also Krista Peterson, whom you've already met. Krista? She gave him a questioning look. The tart at the front. She's, she's his other Ph.D. student, but her goal is to be the future Mrs. Emerson. She just started the program, and she's already baking him cookies, dropping by his office, leaving telephone messages. It's unbelievable. Julia nodded again, but said nothing. Krista doesn't seem to be aware of the strict non-fraternization policy set up by the University, University of Toronto. Paul rolled his eyes and was rewarded with a very pretty smile. He told himself that he would have to make Julia Mitchell smile more often, but that would need to be postponed for now. You'd better go. He wanted to see you after class, and he'll be waiting. Julia quickly tossed her things into, her, into a shabby L.L. Bean knapsack that she, carried, that she had carried since she was a freshman undergraduate. Um, I don't know where his office is. <laughs> Turn left on your way out of the seminar room, then make another left. He has a, the corner office at the end of the hall. Good luck, and I'll see you next class, if not before. She smiled gratefully and exited the seminar room. As she rounded the corner, she saw the professor's office door was ajar. She stood in front of the opening nervously, wondering if she should knock first or peek her head around. After a moment's deliberation, she opted for the former. Straightening her shoulders, she took a deep breath held it, and placed her knuckles in front of the wood paneling. That's when she heard him. I'm sorry I didn't call you back. I was in my seminar. An angry voice, all too familiar now, spat aloud. There was a brief silence before he continued. Because it's the first seminar of the year, asshole, and because the last time I talked to her, she was fine. Julia retreated immediately. It sounded like he was on the telephone yelling. She didn't want him yelling at her, and so she decided to flee and deal with the consequences later. But a heart-wrenching sob tore from his throat and assaulted her ears, and from that, she could not flee. Of 
course I wanted to be there. I loved her. Of course I wanted to be there. Another sob emerged from behind the door. I don't know what time I'll get there. Tell them I'm coming. I'll go straight to the airport and hop on a plane, but I don't know what kind of flight I can get on short notice. He paused. I know. Tell them I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. His voice trailed off into a soft, shuddering cry, and Julia heard him hang up, the, er, hang up his telephone. Without considering her actions, Julia carefully peeked around the door. The thirty-something man held his head in a long-fingered hands, leaning his elbows on his desk and crying. She watched as his wide shoulder shook. She heard anguish and sorrow rip out of his chest as she felt compassion. She wanted to go to him, to offer condolences and comfort and to put her arms around his neck. She wanted to smooth his hair and tell him that she was sorry. She imagined briefly what it would be like to wipe tears away from those expressive sapphire eyes and see them looking at her kindly. She thought about giving him a gentle peck on his cheek, just to reassure him of her sympathy. But watching him cry as if his heart was broken momentarily froze her, and so she did none of those things. When she finally realized where she was, she quickly disappeared back behind the door, blindly pulled a scrap of paper from her knapsack and wrote, I'm sorry, Julia Mitchell. Then, not quite knowing what to do, she placed the paper against the door jam, trapping it there as she silently pulled his office door shut. Julia's shyness was not her primary characteristic. Her best quality, and the one that defined her, was her compassion, a trait that she hadn't inherited from either of her parents. Her father, who was a decent man, tended to be rigid and unyielding. Her mother, who was deceased, had not been compassionate in any way, not even to her only child. Tom Mitchell was a man of few words, but was well known and generally liked. He was a custodian at Susquehanna University and the fire chief of Sellins Grove Borough, Pennsylvania. Since the fire department was entirely volunteer, he and the other firefighters found themselves on call at all times. He inhabited his role proudly and with much dedication, which meant that he was rarely home, even when he wasn't responding to an emergency. On the evening of Julia's first graduate seminar, he called her from the fire station, pleased that she had finally decided to answer her cell phone. How's it going up there, Jules? His voice, unsentimental but com comforting nonetheless, warmed her like a blanket. She sighed. It's fine. The first day was... Interesting, but fine. Those Canadians treating you right? Oh, yes, they're all pretty nice. It's the Americans who are bastards. Well, one American. Tom cleared his throat once or twice, and Julia caught her breath. She knew from years of experience that he was preparing to say something serious. She wondered what it was. Honey, Grace Clark died today. Julia sat upright on her twin bed and stared into space. Did you hear what I said? Yes, yes, I heard. Her cancer came back. They thought she was fine, but it came back, and by the time they found out, it was in her bones and her liver. Richard and the kids are pretty shaken up about it. Julia bit her lip and stifled a sob. I knew you'd take the news hard. She was like a mother to you, and Rachel was such a good friend of yours in high school. Have you heard from her? Um... No, no, I haven't. Why didn't she tell me? I'm not sure when they found out that Grace was sick again. I was over to the house to see her, everyone earlier today, and Gabriel wasn't even there. That's created quite a problem. I don't know what he's walking into when he arrives. There's a lot of bad blood in the family, Tom cursed softly. Are you sending flowers? I guess so. I'm not really good at that sort of thing, but I could ask Deb if she'd help. Deb Lundy was Tom's girlfriend. Julia rolled her eyes at the mention of Deb's name, but kept her negative reaction to herself. Ask her, please, to send something for me. Grace loved gardenias. And just have Deb sign the card. Will do. Do you need anything? No, I'm fine. 
Do you need any money? No, Dad. I have enough to live on with my scholarship if I'm careful. Tom paused, and even before he opened his mouth, she knew what he was about to say. I'm sorry about Harvard. Maybe next year. Julia straightened her shoulders and forced a smile, even though her father couldn't see it. Maybe. Talk to you later. Bye, honey. The next morning, Julia walked a little more slowly on her way to the university, using her iPod as background noise. In her head, she composed an email of condolence and apology to Rachel, writing and rewriting it as she walked. The September breeze was warm in Toronto, and she liked it. She liked being near the lake. She liked sunshine and friendliness. She liked tiny streets free of litter. She liked the fact that she was in Toronto and not in Selins Grove or Philadelphia. That she was hundreds of miles away from him. She only hoped it would stay that way. She was still mentally writing the email to Rachel when she stopped into the office of the Department of Italian Studies to check her mailbox. Someone tapped her on the elbow and moved out of her periphery. She removed her earbuds. Paul, hi. He smiled down at her, his gaze descending from distance, from some dis his gaze descending some distance. Julia was petite, especially in sneakers, and the top of her head merely reached the lower edge of the, his pectorals. How was your meeting with Emerson? His smile faded, and he looked at her with concern. She bit her lip, a nervous habit that she had to stop. That she should stop, but was unable to, primarily because she was unaware of it. Um, I didn't go. He closed his eyes and leaned his head back. He groaned a little. That's not good. Julia tried to clarify the situation. His office door was closed. I think he was on the phone. I'm not sure, so I left a note. Paul noticed her nervousness and the way her delicately arched eyebrows came together. He felt sorry for her and silently cursed the professor for being so abrasive. She looked as if she would bruise easily, and Emerson was obviously oblivious to the way his attitude affected his students, so Paul resolved to help her. If he was on the telephone, he wouldn't w want to be interrupted. Let's hope that's what was going on. Otherwise, I'd say you just took your life into your own hands. He straightened up to his full height and flexed his arms casually. Let me know if there's any fallout, and I'll see what I can do. If he shouts at me, I can take it. I wouldn't want him to shout at you. Because from the looks of it, you'd die of shock, frightened rabbit. Julia appeared as if she wanted to say something, but remained silent. She smiled thinly and nodded as if in appreciation. Then she stepped over to the mailboxes and emptied her pigeonhole. Junk mail, mostly. A few advertisements for the department, including an announcement of public lecture to be delivered by Professor Gabriel O. Emerson, entitled, Lust in Dante's Inferno, The Deadly Sin Against the Self. Julie read the title over several times before she was able to absorb it into her brain. But once it had been absorbed, she hummed softly to herself. She hummed as she noticed a second announcement, which mentioned that Professor Emerson's lecture had been cancelled and rescheduled for a later date. And she hummed as she noticed a third announcement, which declared that all of Professor Emerson's seminars, appointments, and meetings had been cancelled until further notice. As she kept right on humming as she reached back into her pigeonhole for a small square of paper, she unfolded it and read, I'm sorry, Julia Mitchell. She continued to hum as she puzzled over what it meant to find her note in her mailbox the day after she'd placed it in Professor Emerson's door. But her humming finally stopped, as did her heart, when she turned the paper over and read the following. Emerson is an ass. Chapter 3 there was a time when, in reaction to such an embarrassing event, Julia would have dropped to the floor and pulled herself into a fetal position, possibly staying there forever. But at the age of 23, she was made of sterner stuff. So rather than standing in front of the mailboxes and contemplating how, to sh how her short academic career had just gone up in flames and been reduced to a pile of ash at her feet, she quietly finished her business at the university and went home. Pushing all thoughts of her career aside, Julia did four things. First, she pocketed some cash from the emergency fund that was conveniently located in a Tupperware container underneath her bed. 
Second, she walked to the closest liquor store and bought a very large bottle of very cheap tequila. Third, she went home and wrote a long and apologetic condolence email to Rachel. Purposefully, she neglected to mention that she was living in what, where she was living and what she was doing, as she sent the email from her Gmail account rather than her university account. Fourth, she went shopping. The fourth activity was attended only as a weepy and somewhat heartbroken tribute to both Grace and Rachel. Because they had loved expensive things and Julia was in reality too poor to shop. Julia couldn't afford to shop when she came to live in Sullins Grove and met Rachel in their junior year of high school. Julia could barely afford to shop now as she eked out a meager living on her graduate student stipend without the eligibility to work outside the university to supplement her income. As an American on a student's visa, she had limited employability. While she walked slowly past the beautiful shop windows on Bloor Street, she thought of her old friend and her surrogate mother. She stood in front of the Prada store, envisioning the one and only time Rachel had taken her shopping for couture shoes. Julia still had those black Prada stilettos tucked into a shoebox in the back of the closet. They'd only been worn once on the night she discovered she'd been betrayed, and although she would have loved to have destroyed them like she destroyed her dress, she couldn't. Rachel had bought them for her as a coming home present, having had no idea what Julia actually was coming home to. <coughs> then Julia stood for what seemed like forever in front of the Chanel boutique and wept, remembering Grace. How she had always greeted Julia with a smile and a hug whenever she came to visit. How when Julia's mother had passed away under tragic circumstances, Grace had told her that she loved her and would love to be her mother if she'd let her. How Grace had been a better mother to her than Sharon ever had, and Sharon's shame and, Ju and Julia's embarrassment. And when all her tears were gone and the stores had closed for the evening, Julia walked back to her apartment slowly and began to beat herself up for having been a bad surrogate daughter, a lousy friend, and an insensitive twit who didn't know better than to check a scrap of paper to see if it was blank before she left it behind, with her name on it for someone whose beloved mother had just died. What must have been running through his mind when he found that note? Heartened by a shot or two or three of tequila, Julia allowed herself to ask some simple questions. And what must he think of me now? She contemplated packing up all of her belongings and boarding a Greyhound bus bound for her hometown of Sellens Grove, just so she wouldn't have to face him. She was ashamed she hadn't realized it was Grace that Professor Emerson had been discussing on the telephone that terrible day. But she hadn't even contemplated the possibility that Grace's cancer had returned, let alone that she had passed away. And it and Julia had been so upset about having gotten off on the wrong foot with the professor. His hostility was shocking, but even more shocking was his face as he cried. All she had thought about in that terrible moment was comforting him, and that thought alone had distracted her from considering the source of his grief. It wasn't enough that he had just had his heart ripped out by hearing that Grace had died, without having an opportunity to say goodbye or to tell her that he loved her. It wasn't enough that someone, probably his brother Scott, had effectively torn into him for not coming home. No, after having been destroyed by grief and crying like a child, he'd had the delightful experience of opening his office door to escape to the airport and finding her note of consolation and what Paul had written on the other side. Lovely. Julia was surprised that the professor hadn't had her dismissed from the program on the spot. Perhaps he remembers me. One more shot of tequila enabled Julia to formulate the thought, but to think no further as she passed out on the floor. Two weeks later, Julia found herself in a slightly better state as she checked her mailbox in the department. Yes, it was as if she was waiting on death row with no hope of commutation. No, she hadn't dropped out of school and gone home. It was true that she had blushed like a schoolgirl and was painfully shy, but Julia was stubborn, she was tenacious, and she wanted very much to study Dante. And if that meant invoking an unidentified co-conspirator in order to escape the death penalty, she was willing to do so. 
She just hadn't revealed the fact to Paul yet. Julianne, can you come here for a minute? Mrs. Jenkins, the lovely and elderly administrative assistant, called over her desk. Julia obediently walked toward her. Have you had some sort of problem with Professor Emerson? I, um, I don't know. She flushed and began to bite viciously on the inside of her cheek. I received two urgent emails this morning asking me to set up an appointment for you to see him as soon as he returns. I never do this for the professors. They prefer to schedule their own appointments. For some reason, he insisted that I schedule a meeting with you and have the appointment documented in your file. Julia nodded and removed her calendar from her knapsack, trying hard not to imagine the things he had said about her in his emails. Mrs. Jenkins looked at her expectantly. So, tomorrow then? Julia's face fell. Tomorrow? He arrives tonight, and he wants to meet you at four o'clock tomorrow afternoon in his office. Can you be there? I have an email. I have to email him back to confirm. Julia nodded and noted the appointment in her calendar, pretending that the notation was necessary. He didn't say what it was about, but he said it was serious. I wonder what that means, Mrs. Jenkins trailed off absently. Julia concluded her business at the university and went home to pack with the help of Senorita Tequila. By the following morning, most of Julia's clothes were packed into two large suitcases. Not willing to admit defeat to herself or to the tequila, she decided not to pack everything, and thus found herself twiddling her thumbs anxiously and in need of distraction. So, she did the one thing any self-respecting, procrastinating graduate student would do in such a situation besides drink and carouse with other procrastinating graduate students. She cleaned her apartment. It didn't take very long, but by the time she was finished, everything was in perfect order, lightly scented with lemon, and scrupulously clean. Julia took more than a little pride in her achievement and packed her knapsack, head held high. Meanwhile, Professor Emerson was stomping through the halls of the department, leaving graduate students and faculty colleagues spinning in his wake. He was in a foul mood, and no one had the courage to trifle with him. These days he was ill-tempered to begin with, but this fractious disposition had been exacerbated by stress and lack of sleep. He had been cursed by the gods of Air Canada and consequently seated next to a father and his two-year-old child on his flight back from Philadelphia. The child screamed and wet himself, and Professor Emerson, while the father slept soundly. In the semi-darkness of the airplane, Professor Emerson had reflected on the justice of government-enforced sterilization on lax parents as he mopped urine from his Armani trousers. Julia arrived promptly for her four o'clock appointment with Professor Emerson and was delighted to find that his door was closed. Her delight soon left when she realized that that the professor was inside his office growling at Paul. When Paul emerged ten minutes later, still standing tall at six foot three but visibly shaken, Julia's eyes darted to the fire exit. Five steps and she'd be free behind a swinging door, running to escape the police for illegally sounding a fire alarm. It seemed like a temp tempting proposition. Paul caught her eye and shook his head, mouthing a few choice expletives about pr the professor while smiling. Would you like to have coffee with me sometime? Julia looked up at him in surprise. She was already off kilter because of her appointment, so without thinking much about it, she agreed. He smiled and leaned toward her. It would be easier if I had your number. She blushed and quickly took out a piece of paper, checked it to be sure if, she was free, if it was free of any other writings, and hastily scribbled her cell phone number on it. He took the piece of paper, glanced at it, and patted her arm. Give him hell, rabbit. Julia didn't have time to ask him why he thought of her nickname was... Wait a minute. Julia didn't have time to ask him why he thought her nickname was, or even should be, rabbit, because an attractive but impatient voice was already calling her. Now, Miss Mitchell! She walked into his office and stood uncertainly just inside the door. Professor Emerson looked tired, 
There were purplish circles underneath his eyes, and he was very pale, which somehow made him look thinner. As he poured over a file, his tongue flicked out and slowly licked his lower lip. Julius stared, transfixed by his sensual mouth. After a moment, the, through a great effort, she dragged her gaze away from his lips to look at his glasses. She hadn't seen them before. Perhaps he only wore them when his eyes were tired. But today, his penetrating sapphire eyes were partially hidden behind a pair of black Prada glasses. The black frames contrasted sharply with the warm brown of his hair and the blue of his eyes, making the glasses a focal point on his face. She realized immediately that not only has she never seen a professor as attractive as he before, she had never encountered, or encountered a professor who was so studiously put together. He could have appeared in an advertising campaign for Prada, something no professor had ever done before. For it must be noted that university professors are not usually admired for their fashion sense. She knew him well enough to know that he was mercurial. She knew him well enough to know that he was, at least recently, a stickler for politeness and decorum. She knew it would probably be all right if she sat down in one of the comfy leather cha club chairs without his invitation, especially if he remembered her. But given the way he had addressed her, she stood. Please be seated, Miss Mitchell. His voice was cold and flinty, and he gestured to an uncomfortable-looking metal chair instead. Julia sighed and walked over to the stiff Ikea chair that sat just in the front of one of the massive built-in bookcases. She wished... She wished he had given her permission to sit elsewhere, but elected not to quibble with him. Move the chair in front of my desk. I won't crane my neck in order to see you. She stood and did as she was told, nervously dropping her knapsack on the floor. She winced and blushed from head to foot as several of the smaller contents of her bag spilled out, including a tampon that rolled under the Professor Emerson's desk and came to a stop an inch from his leather briefcase. Maybe he won't notice until after I'm gone. Embarrassed, Julia crouched down and began to gather up the other contents of her knapsack. She had just finished when the strap on her very old bag snapped and everything she was carrying crashed to the floor with a loud bang. She kneeled quickly as papers, pins, her iPod, cell phone, and a green apple skidded across the floor and onto the professor's beautiful Persian rug. Oh, gods of all graduate students and eternal screw-ups, kill me now, please. Are you a comedian, Miss Mitchell? Julia's spine stiffened at the sarcasm as she glanced up at his face. What she saw nearly made her burst into tears. How can someone with an angelic name be so cruel? How could a voice so melodic be so harsh? She was momentarily lost in the frozen depths of his eyes, longing for the time when they had looked down at her with kindness. But rather than give in to her despair, she breathed deeply and decided that she had better get used to the way, way he was now, even though it was a grave and painful disappointment. Mutely, she shook her head and went back to filling her now broken knapsack. I expect an answer when I ask a question. Surely you've learned your lesson by now. He studied her quickly, then glanced back at the file in his hands. Perhaps you're not that bright. I beg your pardon, Dr. Emerson. The sound of Julia's voice surprised even her. It was soft but steely. She wasn't sure where her courage had come from, but she silently thanked the gods of graduate students for coming to her aid, just in case. It's Professor Emerson, he snapped. Doctors are a dime a dozen. Even chiropractors and podiatrists refer to themselves as doctors. Sufficiently chastened, Julia tried to zip up her broken knapsack. Unfortunately, the zipper was broken now, too. She held her breath as she pulled on it, trying to coax it back to life with unspoken curses. Would you stop fussing with that ridiculous abomination of a bag and sit in the chair like a human being? She could see that he was beyond furious now, so she placed a ridiculous abomination on the floor and sat quietly in the uncomfortable chair. She folded her hands just to keep them from ringing and waited. You must think you're a comedian. I'm sure you thought this was funny. He threw a piece of paper which landed just shy of her sneakers. Bending down to pick it up, she realized it was a photocopy of the terrible note she'd left for him the day Grace died. 
I can explain. It was a mistake. I didn't write both. I'm not interested in your excuses. I asked you to come to the last appointment and you didn't, did you? But you were on the telephone. The door was closed and- THE DOOR WASN'T CLOSED! He tossed something at her and lo that looked like a business card. I suppose this was meant to be funny too? Julia picked up the discarded item and gasped. It was a small condolence card, the kind one would send with flowers. I'm so, I'm so sorry for your loss. Please accept my sympathy with love, Julia Mitchell. She glanced over and saw what, that he was practically spitting. He was so angry. She blinked rapidly. She tried to find the words to explain it to herself. It's not what you think. I wanted to say that I was sorry and... Hadn't you already done that with the note you left? But this was supposed to be for your family who... Leave my family out of it. He turned his body away from her and closed his eyes, removing his glasses so that he could rub his face with both hands. Julia had been evicted from the realm of the surprised and relocated right into the land of the astonished. No one had explained. He had completely misunderstood her car and no one had set him straight. With a sick feeling in the pit of her stomach, she began to puzzle over what that meant. Oblivious to her musings, the professor appeared to calm himself through a Herculean effort, then closed the file and dropped it contemptuously on his desk. He glared at her. I see that you came here on a scholarship to study Dante. I'm the only professor in the department who is currently supervising thesis in this field. Since this, he gestured between the two of them, is not going to work, you'll have to change your thesis topic and find another supervisor, or transfer to another department, or better yet, another university. I'll inform the director of your program of my decision, effective immediately. Now, if you'll excuse me. He swiveled in his chair toward his laptop and began typing furiously. Julia was stunned. While she was sitting there, silently absorbing not only his tirade, but also his conclusion, the professor spoke, not even bothering to lift his eyes in her direction. That is all, Miss Mitchell. She didn't argue with him, for truly, there was no point. She dragged herself to her feet, still dazed, and picked up her offending knapsack. She cradled it to her chest, somewhat uncertainly, and slowly exited his office, looking very much like a zombie. As she exited the building and crossed to the other side of Bloor Street, Julia realized that she had chosen the wrong day to leave without a jacket. The temperature had dropped and the heavens had opened. Her thin, long-sleeved t-shirt was soaked only five steps outside the department. She hadn't thought to bring an umbrella, so she faced the prospect of walking three long city blocks in wind and cold and rain to get to her apartment. Oh, gods of bad karma and thunderstorms, have mercy upon me. As she walked, Julia took some comfort in her, the realization that her ridiculous abomination of a knapsack was currently serving the very proper purpose of covering her wet and possibly see-through t-shirt and cotton bra. Take that, Professor Emerson. As she walked, she contemplated what had just happened in his office. She had prepared herself by packing two suitcases the night before, just in case. But she had sincerely believed that he would remember. She had believed that he would be kind to her, but he wasn't. He hadn't allowed her to explain the colossal fuck uppery that was the note. He had misunderstood her flowers and card, and he had effectively dismissed her from the program. It was all over. Now she would have to return to Tom's little house in Selen's Grove in disgrace, and he would discover that she had returned and laughed at her. They would laugh at her together. Stupid Julia. Thought she'd leave Selen's Grove and try to make something of herself. Thought she could go to graduate school and become a professor. Who was she kidding? It was all over now, at least for this academic year. Julia looked down at the destroyed and now soaked knapsack as if it were an infant and hugged it tightly to her chest. After her horrid display of gracelessness and ineptitude, she didn't even have her dignity anymore. And to lose it all in front of him after all these years, well, it really was too much to bear. She thought of the lone tampon underneath his desk and knew that 
When he leaned down to pick up his briefcase at five o'clock, her humiliation would be complete. At least she wouldn't have to be there to witness the, his shocked and disgusted reaction. She envisioned him having a cow upon the discovery, literally, lying down on the beautiful Persian rug that graced his office and painfully and loudly giving birth, birth to a calf. After two blocks from her about two blocks from her apartment, Julia's long brown hair was plastered to her head in stringy sheets. Her sneakers squished, squashed with every step. Rain poured off of her as she, as if she were beneath a downspout. Cars and buses whooshed by, and she didn't even bother trying to get out of the way as tidal waves of dirty water crashed over her from the busy street. Like life's disappointments, she simply accepted it. At that moment, another car approached. This one was slowing down appropriately so that she wouldn't be soaked by its splash. It was a new-looking black Jaguar. The Jaguar slowed down even more and came to a stop. As Julia walked by, she saw the passenger door open and a masculine voice called out, Get in! She hesitated. Surely the driver wasn't calling to her. She looked around, but she was the only one foolish enough to be walking in a torrential downpour. Curious, she took a step closer. She knew better than to get in a car with a stranger, even in, Canada, even in a Canadian city. But as she looked into the driver's seat and saw two piercing blue eyes stare back at her, she walked slowly toward him. You'll catch pneumonia and die. Get in. I'll drive you home. His voice was softer now, the fire gone. This was almost the voice that she remembered. So, for the sake of memory, and for, and for no other reason, she climbed into the passenger seat and pulled the door closed, silently apologizing to the gods of jaguars for fouling their pristine black leather interior and immaculate car mats. She paused as the strains of Chopin's Nocturne 9 op number 2 filled her ears, and she smiled to herself. She had always liked that tune. She turned to face the driver. Thank you very much, Professor Emerson. Okay, we're going to leave it there for this one. Because uh, this... This is a weird one, all right? Uh, I, I, I'm not sure that I was entirely ready for this book. As someone who's never read these books before, I'm only, I've only read up until the point where I'm just stopping, and that was just kind of to prepare for this chapter, though, despite the fact that I forgot those freaking words and should have looked them up so I could pronounce them correctly. She knows him. But he's not acting like he knows her. She keeps talking about she hoped he'd remember her, but he doesn't seem to. This is... And it seems like he had some kind of an impact on her. You guys probably know more about this than I do at this point. I can say this. Uh, if that little tidbit right on the end there was supposed to be kind of some kind of a redemption for him, I hope it starts building quickly. Because right now he just seems like an asshole. Chris, then again, um, hating to refer back to where I've been for so long. I think Christian, from Anna's point of view, might have kind of seemed like an asshole. This, there's a lot of parallels here. Uh, he's a good-looking guy. I don't know how attractive she is. It hasn't really gone into much details here. Uh, but um, she, he seems to be having an effect on her. But then again, he seems to have been having an effect on her for years? Long time, at least. I think it's funny that his mother's name was Grace, but she's dead. As opposed to Christian's grace, who is not. I'm having, this, I'm having this weird Batman v Superman thing. Your mother's named Martha? Anyway, uh, not to get off the point. Um, so far, um, if these two, and, I'm only, and I can only assume that these two are going to be the main love interest of this book, they're a hell of a long way from that right now. I don't know. He just picked her up in his Jaguar. They might, might go back to her place and something might happen. I don't know. I guess I'll find out when you hear me find out uh, next time uh, on the next uh, chapter. That was a, uh, well, not the next chapter specifically, because that was like 
the uh, prologue and like the first three chapters. So that's going to do it for part one. Stay tuned for part two, uh, which should be coming out uh, next week. So until then, um, Couch Potato Mike reminding you guys that in the end we're all stories. So let's make them good ones. See you next time, guys.